Theory and Practice from the Standpoint of Dialectical Materialism by Nikolai Bukharin. The crisis of present-day capitalist economy has produced a most profound crisis in the whole of capitalist culture. A crisis in individual branches of science, a crisis in epistemology, a crisis in world outlook, a crisis in world feeling. In such historical circumstances, the question of the interrelations between theory and practice has also become one of the most acute problems, and moreover, as a question both of theory and of practice simultaneously. Therefore, we have to examine problems from various aspects. A as a problem of epistemology, B as a problem of sociology, C as a problem of history, D as a problem of modern culture, Lastly, it is interesting, E, to verify the corresponding theoretical concepts from the gigantic experience of the revolution, and F, to give a certain forecast. 1. The epistemological importance of the problem. The crisis in modern physics, and equally in the whole of natural science, plus the so-called so mental sciences, has raised an urgent problem, and with renewed violence, the fundamental questions of philosophy. The question of the objective reality of the external world, independent of the subject perceiving it, and the question of its cognizability, or alternatively, non-cognizability. Nearly all the schools of philosophy, from theologizing metaphysics to the Avenarian Machist philosophy of pure description, and renovated pragmatism with the exception of dialectical materialism, start from the thesis, considered irrefutable, that I have been given only my own sensations. This statement, the most brilliant exponent of which was Bishop Berkeley, is quite unnecessarily exalted into a new gospel of epistemology. When, for example, M. Schlick on this basis builds up a completely final Dirkus and Gultig turning point in philosophy, it sounded quite naive. Even R. Avenarius thought it necessary to emphasize all the instability of this initial axiom. Yet at the present time, Berkeley's thesis is strolling up and down all the highways of modern philosophy and has become rooted in the communis doctorum opinio with the tenacity of a popular prejudice. Nevertheless, it is not only vulnerable, but will not stand the test of serious criticism. It is defective in various respects, to the extent that it contains I and my, to the extent that it contains the conception of given, and lastly, to the extent that it speaks only of sensations. In point of fact, it is only in the case of the first created atom, just manufactured out of clay and for the first time seeing, again with eyes opened for the first time, the landscape of paradise with all its attributes, that such a statement could be made. Any empirical subject always goes beyond the bounds of pure, sensual, raw material, his experience representing the result of the influence of the external world on the knowing subject in the process of his practice, stands on the shoulders of the experience of other people. In his eye there is always contained we. In the pores of his sensations there already sit the products of transmitted knowledge. The external expression of this are speech, language, and conceptions adequate to words. In his individual experience, there are included beforehand society, external nature, and history, i.e. social history. Consequently, epistemological Robinson Crusoe's are just as much out of place as Robinson Crusoe's were in the atomistic social science of the 18th century. But the thesis criticized is defective, not only from the standpoint of I, my, only sensations. It is defective also from the standpoint of given. Examining the work of A. Wagner, Marx wrote, The doctrinaire professor represents the relations of man and nature from the very outset, not as practical relations, i.e. those founded on action, but as theoretical. But people never begin under any circumstances with standing in theoretical relationship with objects outside the world. Like other animals, they begin by eating, drinking, etc., i.e. they do not stand in any relationship, but function actively, with the help of their actions, take possession of certain objects of the outside world. And in this way, 
satisfy the requirements. Consequently, they begin with production. Thus, the thesis criticized is incorrect, also because it expresses a calmly passive, contemplative point of view, and not an active, functioning point of view, that of human practice, which also corresponds to objective reality. Thus, the far-famed irrefutable epistemological axiom must fall to the ground, for it is in categorical contradiction to objective reality, and it is in just as categorical contradiction to the whole of human practice. One, it is individualistic and leads directly, directly to solipsism. Two, it is anti-historical. Three, it is quietist. Therefore, it must be rejected with all decisiveness. Lest there should be any misunderstanding, we entirely adopt the standpoint that sensuality, sensual experience, etc., having as their source the material world existing outside our consciousness, constitute the point of departure and beginning of cognition. It was just from this that began the philosophical rebellion of Feuerbach against the yoke of the idealistic abstractions and pan panlogism of Hegel. Of course, individual sensations are a fact. But historically, there is no absolutely unmixed individual sensation beyond the influence of external nature, beyond the influence of other people, beyond the elements of mediated knowledge, beyond historical development, beyond the individual as the product of society, and society in active struggle against nature. And in the axiom under consideration, what is important is its logical purity. If the latter disappears, the whole axiom disappears. For this reason, the arguments which we put forward are actual arguments. From the above, it can already be seen what a vast role the problem of theory and practice plays from the standpoint of epistemology. We pass now to the consideration of this theme. First of all, it should be noted that both theory and practice are the activity of social man. If we examine theory not as petrified systems, and practice not as finished products, i.e. not as dead labor petrified in things, but in action, we shall have before us two forms of labor activity. The bifurcation of labor into intellectual and physical labor, mental and material, theoretical cognition and practical action. Theory is accumulated and condensed practice. To the extent that it generalizes the practice of material labor and is qualitatively a particular and specific continuation of material labor, it is itself qualitatively a special theoretical practice to the extent that it is active. Practice fashioned by thought. On the other hand, practical activity utilizes theory, and to this extent, practice itself is theoretical. In actual fact, we have in every classic society divided labor and consequently a contradiction between intellectual and physical labor, i.e. a contradiction between theory and practice. But like every division of labor, here too it is a living unity of opposites. Action passes into cognition, cognition passes into action. Practice drives practice practice drives forward cognition. Cognition fertilizes practice. Both theory and practice are steps in the joint process of the reproduction of social life. It is extremely characteristic that from that from of old, the question has been asked, how is cognition possible? But the question is not asked, how is action possible? There is epistemology, but no learned men have yet thought of inventing some special praxeology. Yet one passes into the other, and Bacon himself, sweet, justifiably spoke of the confidence of knowledge and power, and of the interdependence of the laws of nature and norms of practice. In this way, practice breaks into the theory of cognition. Theory includes practice and real epistemology, i.e. epistemology which bases itself upon the unity, not the identity, of theory and practice, includes the practical criterion, which becomes the criterion of the truthfulness of cognition. The relative social disruption of theory and practice is a basis for a break between the theory of cognition and practical action, or for the construction of a super-experimental theory as a skilled free supplement to the usual and earthly forms of human knowledge. Hegel has the unity of theory and practice in a particularly idealistic form. 
unity of the theoretical and practical idea as cognition, unity which overcomes the one-sidedness of theory and practice, taken separately, unity precisely in the theory of cognition. In Marx, we find the materialistic and simultaneously dialectical teaching of the unity of theory and practice, of the primacy of practice, and of the practical criterion of truth in the theory of cognition. In this way, Marx save a striking, saves a striking philosophical synthesis, in face of which the labored efforts of modern pragmatism, with its theological and idealistic contortions, its super-artificial and laborious constructions of fictionalism, etc., seem but childish babble. The interaction between theory and practice their unity develops on the basis of the primacy of practice. One, historically, the sciences grow out of practice, the production of ideas differentiates out of the production of things. Two, sociolo so sociologically, social being determines social consciousness. The practice of material labor is the constant force motrice, or motrice, motrice of the whole of social development. Three, epistemologically, the practice of influence on the outside world is the primary given quality. From this follow extremely important consequences in the exceptionally gifted theses of Marx on Feuerbach. We read. Um, this is all in German, so there's no like English translation. So there's really no point in reading it. So it's a quote from, Feuer from Marx on Feuerbach, whatever. The problem of the external world is here, but as the problem of its transformation, the problem of the cognition of the external world as an integral part of the problem of transformation, the problem of theory as a practical problem. Practically and consequently epistemologically, the external world is given as the object of active influence on the part of social, historically developing man. The, the external world has its history. The relations growing up between subject and object are historical. The forms of these relations are historical. Practice itself, in theory, the forms of active influence and the forms of cognition, the modes of production and the modes of conception are historical. I lost my spot. The question of the existence of the external world is categorically superfluous, since the since the reply is already evident, since the external world is given, just as practice itself is given. Just for this reason, in practical life, there are no seekers after solipsism. There are no agnostics, no subjective idealists. Consequently, epistemology, including praxeology, epistemology, which is praxeology, must have its point of departure in the reality of the external world not as a fiction, not as an illusion, not as a hypothesis, but as a basic fact. And just for this reason, Boltzmann declared with every justification that the premise about the unreality of the external world is die grost nerheit die ein menschen gehirn ausgebrütet hat. It's been a while since I've had to like horribly mispronounced German. It is in contradiction to all the practice of humanity. <laughs> True. Whereas E. Mach, in his analysis of sensations, <clears throat> considers that from the scientific and not the practical standpoint, the question of the reality of the world, whether it exists in reality or whether it is an illusion, a dream, to be impermissible, since even the most incongruous dream is a fact no worse than any other. This theory of cognition acquired from Weyhinger, a demonstrative character, as he erected fiction into a principle and system of cognition. This peculiar somnambulistic epistemology was foreseen in his day by Calderon. There's a quote here now. I think it's Spanish? I wouldn't really know. But there's no English translation, so I'm going to skip that part. Practice is an active breakthrough into reality, egress beyond the limits of the subject, penetration into the object, the humanizing of nature, its alteration. 
Practice is the refutation of agnosticism, the process of transforming things in themselves into things for us. The best proof of the adequacy of thought and of its truth understood historically as a process. For if the objective world is changed through practice and according to practice, which includes theory, this means that practice verifies the truth of theory. And this means that we know to a certain extent and come to know more and more objective reality, its qualities, its attributes, its regularities. Therefore, the fact of technology, as Engels already remarked in Anti-During, confutes Kantian agnosticism, that paltry doctrine in the words of Hegel. If K. Pearson and a grammar of science modernizes the well-known cave of Plato, replacing it by a telephone exchange and the pale shades of the platonic ideas by telephone signals, he thereby demonstrates his own conception of the passively contemplative character of cognition. The real subject, i.e. social and historical man, is not in the least like either Carl Pearson's telephonist or the observer of the platonic shades. He likewise does not in the least resemble that stenographer, inventing convenient signs in shorthand, and to whom the philosophizing mathematicians and physicists desire to transform him. Uh, B. Russell, Wittgenstein, Frank, Schlick, and others. For he is actively transforming the world. He has changed the face of the whole of the earth. Living and working in the biosphere, social man has radically remolded the surface of the planet. The physical landscape is evermore becoming the seat of some branch of industry or agriculture. An artificial material medium has filled space. Gigantic successes of technique and natural science confront us. The radius of cognition with the, pro with the progress of exact apparatus of measurement and new methods of research has grown extremely wide. We already weigh planets, study their chemical composition, photograph invisible rays, etc. We foretell objective changes in the world, and we change the world. But this is unthinkable without real knowledge. Pure symbolism, stenography, a system of signs, of fictions, cannot serve as an instrument of objective changes carried out by the subject. Cognition, considered historically, is the more and more adequate reflection of objective reality. The fundamental criterion of the correctness of cognition is therefore the criterion of its adequateness, its degree of correspondence to objective reality. The instrumental criterion of truth is not in contradiction to this criterion, but coincides with it. If it is only a question of an instrument for the practice of social man transforming the objective world, Marxist revolutionary revolutionary praxis, um, Engels's Unwaldsind praxis, and not of the individual practice of any Philistine in a beer shop. Therefore, the instrumental criterion of pragmatism, Bergson close to pragmatism, pragmatism <laughs> W. James and others, must be rejected with all decisiveness. James includes as practice, prayer, the experience of religious ecstasy, etc. Doubting the existence of the material world, he does not doubt at all the existence of God, like, by the way, many other adherents of so-called scientific thought. The criterion of economy of thought can in no way serve as a criterion, since the economy itself can only be established post-factum. While taken in isolation as a bare principle of cognition in itself, it means the a priori liquidation of the complexity of thought, i.e. its deliberate incorrectness. In this way, economy is transformed into its very opposite. Man's thinking is only economic when it correctly reflects objective reality, and the criterion of this correctness is practice, experiment, industry. We see, consequently, the modern capitalist theories of cognition either do not deal with the question of practice altogether, or treat of practice in the Pickwickian sense, tearing it away from the material world or from the highest forms of cognition, pragmatism, conventionalism, fictionalism, etc. The only true position is held by dialectical materialism, which rejects all, s all species of idealism and agnosticism, and overcomes the narrowness of mechanical materialism. Its ahistoricism, its anti-dialectical character, its failure to understand problems of quality, its contemplative, contemplative objectivism, etc. 2. Theory and practice from the sociological standpoint, historical forms of society and the connection of theory and practice. 
Dialectical materialism as a method of cognition applied to social development has created the theory of historical materialism. The usual conception of Marxism is that of a variety of the mechanical, natural scientific materialism typical of the teachings of the French encyclopedists of the what the fuck, 18th century or Buchner Malschot. This is fundamentally wrong, for Marxism is built up entirely on the idea of historical development, foreign to the hyper hypertrophied rationalism of the encyclopedists. The question of theory in general must be put as follows from what is said above, from the standpoint of, so, of social theory, i.e. the standpoint of so, socio, sociology and history. At the present time, all scientists more or less acquainted with the facts and all research workers recognize that genetically theory grew up out of practice and that any branch of science has in the long run its practical roots. From the standpoint of social development, science or theory is the continuation of practice. But to adapt the well-known remark of Clausewitz, by other means, the function of science in the sum total of the process of reproduction of social life is the function of orientation in the external world and in society, the function of extending and deepening practice, increasing its effectiveness, the function of a peculiar struggle with nature, with the elemental progress of social development, with the classes hostile to the given socio-historical order, the idea of the self-sufficient character of science, science for science's sake, is naive. It confuses the subjective passions of the professional scientist, working in a system of profound division of labor in conditions of a disjointed society in which individual social functions are crystallized in a diversity of types, psychologies, passions, as Schiller says, science is a goddess, not a milch, a milch cow. With the objective social role of this kind of activity as an activity of vast practical importance. The fetishizing of science as of other phenomena of social life and the deification of the corresponding categories is a perverted ideological reflex of a society in which the division of labor has destroyed the visible connection between social function, separating them out in the consciousness of their agents as absolute and sovereign values. Yet any, even the most abstract, branch of science has a sweet, definite, vital importance. I think sweet is just like randomly added in here for like no, it never makes sense. Let me start that sentence over. Yet any, even the most abstract, branch of science has a definite vital importance in the course of historical development. Naturally, it is not a question of the direct practical importance of any individual principle, e.g. in the sphere of the theory of numbers or the doctrine of quantities or the theory of conditioned reflexes. It is a question of systems as a whole, of appropriate activity, of chains of scientific truths representing in the long run the theoretical expression of the struggle with nature and social struggle and the social struggle. Active relationship with the external world which at the purely animal stage of human development presupposes the natural organs of man as a variety of hominous sapien sapientists is replaced by relationship through the medium and with the help of the continuation of those organs, i.e. with the help of the productive organs of social man, the implements of labor and systems of social technique. At first, this system is really the continuation of the organs of the human body, Later, it becomes complicated and acquires its own principles of movement, e.g. the circular motions of modern machinery. But at the same time, there develops historically also orientation in the external world, again with the help of artificial instruments of cognition, instruments of spiritual labor, extending a gigantic number of times the sphere of action of the, nature organ the natural organs of the body and the instruments of orientation. Microbalances, the water level, seismo seismographs, the telephone, the telescope, the microscope, the ultra microscope, the chronoscope, the Michelson grating, electrical thermometers, bolometers, the photoelectrical element of Elster and Geidel, galvanoscopes and galvanometers, electrometers, the apparatus of Aronaft and Milliken, etc., etc. Nobody likes to make lists like Bucharin, I swear so tedious. 
All these immeasurably widen our natural sensual capacities, open new worlds, render possible the victorious advance of technique. It is a piece of historic irony at the expense of the greatly multiplied agnostics who completely fail to understand the value of transmitted knowledge and reduce the whole process of cognition to the production of tautology. The precise, that precisely the electrical nature of matter is the last word of science, since, since it is just the electrical feeling which we lack. Yet the whole world of electricity was discovered to us nonetheless by means of the application of artificial organs of sensation. Thus there have proved to be historically variable both the organs of sensation and the so-called picture of the world, verified by the gigantic practice of modern humanity as a whole, a picture of the world much more adequate to reality than all its predecessors, and therefore so fruitful for practice. And so man is historically given as social man in contradistinction to the enlightened Robinsons of Rousseau, founding society and history like a chess club and with the help of a contract. This social man, i.e. human society, in order to live, must produce. M. and Feng Wor Di Tat, in contrast to the Christian Logos, in the beginning was the word. Production is the real starting point of social development. In the process of production, there takes, a place, er, there takes place a metabolism between society and nature. In this process, active on the part of historical and social man and material process, people are in definite relationship one with another and with the means of labor. These relations are historical. Their totality constitutes the economic structure of society. It is also a historic variable. In contradistinct in contradistinction to the theories of society generally, eternal society, ideal society, etc., the economic structure of society, the mode of production, includes, above all, the relationship between classes. On this basis, there grows up the superstructure, political organizations and state power, moral norms, scientific theories, art, religion, philosophy, etc. The mode of production determines also the mode of conception, Theoretical activity is a step in the reproduction of social life. Its material is furnished by experience, the breadth of which depends on the degree of power over the forces of nature, which is determined in the long run by the development of productive forces, the productivity of social labor, the level of technical development. Stimuli proceed from the tasks set by practice. The forming principles, the mode of conception in the literal sense, reflect the mode of production. The socio-class structure of society and its complex requirements, the idea of rank, authority, the hierarchy, and the personal god in feudal society, the idea of the impersonal force of fate, of the, ele of the elemental process, of the impersonal god in capitalist commodity society, etc. The prevailing conceptions are those of the ruling class, which is the bearer of the given mode of production. But just as development in natural history changes the forms of biological species, the historical development of society with the movement of productive forces at its foundation changes the socio-historic forms of labor, social structures, modes of production, together with which there changes the whole ideological superstructure up to and including the highest forms of theoretical cognition and reflective illusions. The movement of productive forces, the contradiction between them and the historic forms of social labor are, consequently, the cause of the change in these forms, realized through class struggle, to the extent that we are speaking of class societies, and the blowing up of the out-of-date social structure transformed from a form of development to fetters on development. In this way, the practice of material labor is the basic motive force of the entire process as a whole. The practice of the class struggle is the critical revolutionary practice of social transformation. Criticism weapons which take the place of the weapon of criticism. The practice of scientific cognition is the practice of material labor continued in particular forms, natural science, of administration and the class struggle, the social sciences. The class subjectivism of the forms of cognition in no way excludes the objective significance of cognition. In a certain measure, cognition of the external world and social laws is possessed by every class. But the specific methods of conception in their historical progress variously condition the process of the development of the adequateness of cognition and the advance of history may lead to such a method of conception as will become a fetter upon cognition itself. 
This occurs on the eve of the, destru of the destruction of the given mode of production and its class promoters. It is from this historical materialist angle that we should also approach the exceptionally complicated question of the interrelations between the theoretical and applied sciences. Here, there is a considerable number of various solutions. A, to take as a criterion the difference between causal theoretical series and teleological normative series, rule, system of rules, prescriptions. B, to take as a criterion distinction according to objects, the pure sciences study the natural surroundings given to man, the applied sciences, the artificial surroundings, machines, transport technique, apparatus, raw materials, etc. C, to take as criterion time, the pure sciences work with a long period in view, forestalling developments, the applied serve the needs of the moment. And D, to take as criticism, or to take as criterion, lastly, the degree of generality, abstractness of the particular science. On this subject, it is necessary to remark, A, on the first criterion, sciences teleologically set forth at bottom are not sciences, but arts. However, any system of norms, we have not here in mind ethics and the like, depends upon a system of objective laws, which are either covertly understood or directly set forth as such. On the other hand, the sciences, in the particular sense of the word, pure sciences, are not pure, since the selection of an object is determined by aims which are practical in the long run, and this, in its turn, can and must be considered from the standpoint of the causal regularity of social development. B, on the second criterion, engineering, for example, may be set forth as a pure study, i.e. theoretically without norms, without constructive rules. However, usually in its enunciation, we also have a teleological and normative element. The same has to be said, e.g. of the resistance of materials, the science of staple commodities, and so forth. This is not an accident, for here the object itself, the artificial surroundings, is material practice. C on the third criterion, a vividly practical task may also be protracted, e.g. the problem of aeronautics, as it stood for a number of centuries or at the present time, the transmission of energy from a distance, a task which always has its purely theore theoretical equivalent as well. D, on the fourth criterion, a very concrete science may also be purely theoretical, since knowledge has broken up into a number of rivulets and has become extremely specialized. It would hardly come into anyone's head, for example, to classify the Japhetic theory of language among the applied sciences, although it also, of course, is bound up with a number of the most important practical tasks. Here we should also note the relativity of the, con of the conceptions of concrete and abstract. And so apparently all the definitions are defective. The most accurate definition is the division according to the characteristic of causal teleological series. However, here too we see obvious defects from the standpoint of actual relationship. But all these defects of logical definition reveal the objective dialectics of reality. Contradictions arise here because there is an objective contradiction between theory and practice, and at the same time their unity. There is their difference as opposite poles of human activity, and at the same time their interpretation. There is their separate existence as functions, as branches of divided social labor, and at the same time their unitary existence as steps in the joint production of social life. Under the cover of the difficulty of the exact demarcation of the applied and theoretical sciences beats the dialectics of the relationship between theory and practice. The passing of one into the other, which does not fit and cannot fit into the framework of school logic and academical pedantic definitions. In reality, we have a whole chain of various theoretical sciences linked up by internal connections. The classification of sciences of which each analyses or analyzes a separate form of motion or a number of interconnected forms of motion which pass into one another is also a classification or hierarchy of these very forms of motion according to the order inherent in them, and just in this lies its significance. These sciences are born out of practice, which first sets itself technical tasks, 
the latter require in their turn the solution of theoretical problems, problems of the first, second, etc. order, a special relative logic of motion being thereby created. Practice in this way grows into theory. The sought-for rule of action is transformed into the search for the law of objective relationship. There arise innumerable knots and interlacings of problems with their solutions. These, in their turn, sometimes fertilize a number of hierarchically lower branches of science, and through technology penetrate into technique, consequently into the direct practice of material labor, transforming the world. Here, law becomes transformed into a rule of action. The percipient decision is verified by that action. Orientation in the surroundings becomes the alteration of those surroundings. The intellect is immersed in the will. Theory once again reverts to the form of practice, but this, but this metamorphosis has its final result by no means a simple repetition of the previous cycle of practice, since practice becomes practice on a more powerful and qualitatively altered basis. The problem of the pure and applied sciences reflecting and expressing the problem of theory and practice is not, however, a purely logical problem. It is itself a problem of history and a problem of transforming historical practice. The acuteness of the problem in the innermost recesses of the capitalist order and even the seeing of the problem itself is the theoretical expression of the real separation, fixed in terms of profession and class, and rupture between theory and practice a rupture naturally relative and not absolute. This rupture consequently is a historical phenomenon. It is bound up with a definite historical economic formation, with a definite historically transitory mode of production, with the bifurcation of labor into intellectual and physical labor, with the polarization of classes. It may therefore be said with every justification that socioeconomic formations, modes of production, um, economic structures, differ from one another also in the particular character of the relationship between theory and practice. And in fact, in the theocratic state of ancient Egypt, there were elements of a natural centralized planned economy. Knowledge, theory, was most closely connected with practice, since it was expediently directed towards practice. But this connection was of a special type. Knowledge was inaccessible to the mass of workers. Their practice for them was blind and knowledge was surrounded with an areola of dread mystery. In this sense, there was a vast rupture between theory and practice. If we take for comparison the epoch of industrial capitalism, the epoch of the flourishing of economic man, of boundless individualism, of laissez-faire, we see a different picture. On a social scale, no one puts forward in an organized fashion either problems of cognition or problems of application of acquired knowledge. The division of labor creates a group of scientists and ideologues bound up with the ruling class, which in its turn is broken to pieces by competition. The connection between theory and practice is to a considerable extent built up privately, but the bifurcation of intellectual and physical labor does not disappear. It receives a different expression, a certain degree of democratization of knowledge necessary from a standpoint of technique. The formation of a large stratum of technical and other intelligentsia, the specialization of science, the creation of high theoretical generalizations, completely remote from the consciousness of the mass of practical workers, wage workers. This is another type of connection. Its inevitable consequence is the abstract and impersonal fetishism of science, science for science's sake the disappearance of the social self-consciousness of science, etc. Modern capitalism reproduces this anarchy on the new and more powerful basis of trustified industrial complexes and the corresponding scientific organizations, but it cannot either discover a scientific synthesis or attain the self-knowledge of science or achieve its organization or its fusion with practice. These problems, which are poignantly felt, lead already beyond the boundaries of capitalism. 3. Theory and Practice of the USSR and the Empirical Test of Historical Materialism It follows from all the foregoing that the question of theory and practice is simultaneously both a theoretical and a practical question, that both theory and practice, and likewise the forms of combination of theory and practice, are bound up with a definite historical order of society, 
its development, its motion. Therefore, it is beyond all doubt, all doubt that a particularly stormy course of social life, a revolution, and a new social order, socialism in Worden, are of exceptional interest from the standpoint of the problem we are considering. All knowledge is tested in practice by experience. The same has to be said of the systematized knowledge of theory, theoretical tendency, doctrine. It is relevant here to record, first of all, that Marxism, weighed in the balance of history, has been verified therein in the most varied directions. Marxism foretold the war. Marxism foretold the period of revolutions and the whole character of the epoch we are going through. Marxism foretold the dictatorship of the proletariat and the rise of a socialist order. Even earlier had been brilliantly justified the theory of the concentration and centralization of capital, etc. The revolution has proved the great destroyer of fetishes. Fetishes. Fetishes, yeah laying bare the fundamental links and interdependent interdependences of society in their real significance. The state appeared to bourgeois science now as a distinct organism, even up to the point of determining its sex, now as a fantasy, now as an expression of the absolute spirit, now as the universal organization of the popular will, etc. The revolution has destroyed one state and built up another, it has practically invaded this sphere of reality and has ascertained the component parts of the state and its functions and its personnel and its material appendages and its class significance and its significance from the standpoint of, of economics. The revolution has completely confirmed the theoretical teaching of Marx on the state. The same has happened to the norms of law with law itself. Juridical fetishism has burst into atoms. Morality, which found its theoretical justification in the categorical imperative of Kant, and which reached its highest stage of deification, disclosed itself to be a system of relative historical norms, with a quite earthly, quite social, and quite historical origin. Religion, which is revered as the highest product of human thought, proved to be a caste taken from a society of lords and slaves a construction on the model of a dualist society, on the model of a hierarchical ladder of domination and exploitation. For this very reason, it began rapidly to die out. But the revolution in reflective categories, which was the inevitable result of the material revolution, has not yet concluded. We are patently viewing its first phase. Here it is necessary to dwell on some problems in this connection related to the question of theory and practice. The capitalist economic order is a system of unorganized, elementally developing, and as a whole, irrational economic life. Anarchy of production, competition, crises, etc. The socialist economic order is a system of organized, planned, and anti-exploiter economy in which little by little there disappears the division between town and country, intellectual and physical labor. Hence follow vast consequences. First of all, it is necessary to note the changes in the character of social regularity. The regularity of capitalism is an elemental regularity, coming into existence irrespective of and sometimes against the will of man. Typical examples are the, are the regularity of the industrial cycle, of crisis, etc. This regularity shows itself in the shape of a compulsory law. like the law of gravity when a house falls on your head. In relation to the actions of individual persons, this regularity is irrational, even though every one of them should act according to all the rules of rational calculation. This irrational current of life is the consequence of the anarchic character of the capitalist structure. The regularity in organized socialist society is of a different type. It loses, if we are speaking of a process, it begins to lose its elemental character. The future lies ahead as a plan, an aim. Causal connection is realized through social teleology. Regularity shows itself not post factum, not unforeseen, incomprehensible, blind. It shows itself as recognized necessity. Freedom is recognized necessity, realized through action organized on a social scale. Consequently, here is present a different type of regularity, a different relationship between the individual and society, 
a different relationship between causal and teleological theories. In capitalistic society, the theoretical foreknowledge of the general course of events does not provide the instrument for taking direct control of that course. And there is no subject to set himself such a task. Society itself is, sub is subjectless, blind, unorganized. In socialist society, the theoretical foreknowledge of the necessity can at once become a norm of action on the scale of the whole of society i.e. on the scale of the whole, thereby is afforded the possibility of the fusion of theory and practice, the gigantic social synthesis, historically more and more realized in the measure of the elimination of the rupture between intellectual and physical labor. In the economic life of capitalism, the elementary social necessity of, def of definite proportions between the branches of production is achieved by means of an elemental fluctuation of prices in which the law of value expresses itself as the elemental regulator of socio-productive life. In the economic life of socialism, the distribution of resources, means of production and labor power, takes place as a constructive task of a plan. But the plan does not fall from the sky. It is itself the expression of recognized necessity. Consequently, here, A, the tasks of, cogn of cognition expand to a colossal degree, B. This cognition must embrace a huge quantity of problems and express itself in the work of all branches of science. C. This cognition must become synthetic, for a plan is a synthesis, and a scientifically elaborated plan can rely only on a synthesis. D. This cognition is directly bound up with practice. It relies on practice, it serves it, it passes into it, for the plan is active. It is at one and the same time a product of scientific thought, laying bare causal regularities and a system of purposes, an instrument of action, the direct regulator of practice and its component part. But the plan of socialist construction is not only a plan of economy, the process of the rationalization of life, beginning with the suppression of irrationality in the economic sphere, wins away from it one position after another. The principle of planning invades the sphere of mental production, the sphere of science, the sphere of theory. Thus there arises here a new and much more complex problem. The problem of the rationalization not only of the material economic basis of a society, but also of the relations between the sphere of material labor and spiritual labor. End of relations within the latter. The most striking expression of this is the question of the planning of science. In the ideological life of capitalism, a certain social necessity of, de of definite proportions, much less definite than in economic life, between the various branches of ideological labor is regulated to an extremely small extent by the state. The only sphere which is completely regulated is the production and diffusion of religious ideas through the organization of the state church. The regularities of development here are here also elemental. Those basic principles which the theory of historical materialism puts forward cannot serve as a standard of action for the ruling class on the social scale of that action, for the same reason that a capitalist plan is unre unrealizable. A plan is in contradiction to the very structure of capitalism, the prime dominance of its structure and its development. Here, too, the building of socialism puts the whole problem in a new way. The elemental regularity of interdependences between economy and ideology, between collective economic practice and the multifarious branches of theoretical labor, yield place to a considerable degree to the principle of planning. At the same time, all the basic proportions of the theory of historical materialism are confirmed. One can feel with one's hands, as it were, how the requirements of the rapid and intensive growth of the USSR imperiously dictate the solution of a number of technical problems. How the solution of these problems in its turn dictates the posing of the greatest theoretical problems, including the general problems of physics and chemistry. One can feel with one's hands how the development of socialist agricult agriculture pushes forward the development of genetics, biology generally, and so on. It can be observed how the exceptionally insistent need for the study of the natural wealth of the Union broadens the field of geological research, pushes forward geology, geochemistry, etc., and all the poverty of the idea that the utility of science means its degradation, the narrowing of its scope, etc., becomes crystal clear and apparent.
Great practice requires great theory. The building of science in the USSR is proceeding as the conscious construction of the scientific superstructures. The plan of scientific works is determined in the first instance by the technical and economic plan, the perspectives of technical and economic development. But this means that thereby we are arriving not only at a synthesis of science, but at a social synthesis of science and practice. The relative disconnection between theory and practice characteristic of capitalism is being eliminated. The fetishism of science is being abolished. Science is reaching the summit of its social self self-cognition. But the socialist unification of theory and practice is their most radical unification. For gradually destroying the division between intellectual and physical labor, extending the so-called higher education to the whole mass of workers, socialism fuses theory and practice in the heads of millions. Therefore, the synthesis of theory and practice signifies here an exceptional increase in the effectiveness of scientific work and of the effectiveness of socialist economy as a whole. The unification of theory and practice of science and labor is the entry of the masses into the arena of cultural creative work and the transformation of the proletariat from an, ob an object of culture into its subject, organizer, and creator. This revolution in the very foundations of cultural existence is accompanied necessarily by a revolution in the methods of science. Synthesis presupposes the unity of scientific method, and this method is dialectical materialism, objectively representing the highest achievement of human thought. Correspondingly is being also, is, correspondingly is being also built up the organization of scientific work. Together with concentrated planned economy, there is growing the organization of scientific institutions, which is being transformed into a vast association of workers. In this way is arising a new society, growing rapidly, rapidly overtaking its capitalist antagonists, more and more unfolding the hidden possibilities of its internal structure. It's depressing to read stuff like that. From the standpoint of world history, the whole of humanity, the whole orbis terrarum, has fallen apart into two worlds, two economic and cultural historic systems. Oh, no. Great world historic antithesis has arisen. There is taking place before our very eyes the polarization of economic systems, the polarization of classes, the polarization of the methods of combining theory and practice, the polarization of the modes of conception, the polarization of cultures. The crisis of bourgeois consciousness goes deep and traces out marked furrows. On the whole front of science and philosophy, we have gigantic dislocations which have been excellently formulated from the standpoint of their basic orientation by O. Span. The main thing is a war of destruction against materialism. This is the great task of culture in the opinion of the warlike professor who protests against knowledge without God and knowledge without virtue. In economic ideology, under the influence of the crisis of the capitalist system, there has begun the direct preaching of a return to the pick and the hoe, to pre-machine methods of production. In the sphere of spiritual culture, the return to religion, the substitution of intuition, inward feeling, contemplation of the whole for rational cognition, the turn from individualist forms of consciousness is patent. It is universal, the idea of the whole, wholeness, in philosophy, in biology, in physics, in psychology, in economic geography, territorial complexes, in zoology and botany, the doctrine of heterogeneous societies of plants and animals, in political economy, the collapse of the school of marginal utility, social theories, the universalism of span, and so on and so forth. But this turn to the whole takes place on the basis of the absolute breaking away of the whole from its parts. On the basis of idealistic understanding of the whole, on the basis of a sharp turn to religion, on the basis of the methods of supersensual cognition. It smells like burning. That's promising. It is not surprising, therefore, that from any scientific hypothesis, quasi philosophic, essentially religious conclusion conclusions are being drawn. And on the extreme and most consistent wing, there is openly being advanced the watchword of a new medievalism. Medievalism. 
In complete opposition to this comprehensible development, young socialism is arising. Its economic principle, the maximum of, maximum of technical economic power, planfulness, development of all human capacities, and requirements, its cultural historical approach determined by the Marxist outlook. Against religious metaphysics, advancing dialectical materialism, against enfeebled intuitive contemplation, cognitive and practical activism, against flight into non-existent meta-empirical met heavens, the sociological self-cognition of all ideologies, against the ideology of pessimism, despair, fate, fatum, the revolutionary optimism which overturns the whole world, against the complete disruption of theory and practice, their greatest synthesis, against the crystallization of an elite, the uniting of the millions. It is not only a new economic system which has, been, which has been born, a new culture has been born, a new science has been born, a new style of life has been born. This is the greatest antithesis in human history, which both theoretically and practically will be overcome by the forces of the proletariat, the last class aspirants to power, the last class aspiring to power? in order in the long run to put an end to all power whatsoever.